Uh, good evening once again and uh, happy Sabbath wherever you are tuned in. Uh, we are glad to be together once again in this series of uh, the prophets and uh, the messengers. And uh, this presentation is uh, number 21 in the series, part 9 of uh, Appeal to Common Sense. And uh, I'm looking at uh, God shall execute uh, judgment. God shall execute judgment. I invite you for a word of prayer as uh, we look into this presentation and uh, see what uh, the Lord will want us to learn in this time. Shall we be able to pray? Our Heavenly Father, once again, glory and honor be unto thy name. Thank you for the Sabbath and thank you for the week that uh, has been. With challenges, Lord, we come unto thee that you may give us the peace and the comfort that we need at such a time as this. And so continue guiding us and uh, helping us, Lord, to just uh, receive the blessings, accept the blessings that is bestowed upon us through the <clears throat> gift of your Son. Bless your people wherever they are this day, worshiping you and others preparing for the Sabbath. In Jesus' name, amen. And so uh, I thank the Lord that uh, at, la at last uh, we can recuperate, we can uh, relax from uh, our <clears throat> normal uh, weaker uh, schedules and uh, works and be able to repose in the presence of the Lord to be blessed and uh, to just... Uh, grow in spirit, contemplate upon uh, his creation and think about the atonement that is going on in the heavenly sanctuary. This is uh, looking into the justice of God. And uh, uh, this is not about to bring controversy, but uh, just uh, to shed more light on how I understand things. And uh, <clears throat> I'd like to start with the uh, something that uh, we can identify with from Red Controversy, page 556, paragraph 1. Spiritualism, <clears throat> the foundation of all false doctrines. But none need to be deceived by the lying claims of spiritualism. God has given the world sufficient light to enable them to discover the snare. As already shown, the theory which forms the very foundation of spiritualism is at war with the plainest statement of the scripture. The Bible declares that the dead know not anything, that their thoughts have perished, that they have no part in anything that is done under the sun. They know nothing of the joys or sorrows of those who are dearest to them on the earth. Why would I bring spiritualism in this presentation on God shall execute judgment? When uh, you mess up uh, with uh, the state of the dead, then uh, there is no uh, executive or executive judgment at the end. But the statement I wanted us to highlight there is that uh, spiritualism is at war with the plainest statements of the scripture. Anytime we enter into warring against the plainest statements of spiritualism of uh, the Bible, we are entering into the realms of spiritualism in which way fallen angels will work on our minds and then they'll come in the form of the people who are once alive and they are dead. And now they, they'll be like they are bringing you information to work with as you are still living while they are dead. And so it's like the dead are not dead, but they are still living. But also it messes up with the, the judgments of the Lord, because if God will at last judge the dead, why are they still living while they are dead and enjoying uh blissful time somewhere now uh on this issue god shall execute judgment the punishment of adulterers the punishment of idolaters. of all the sins that god will punish none are more grievous in his sight than those that encourage others to do evil god will have his servants prove their loyalty by faithfully rebuking transgression however painful the act may be those who are honored with a divine commission are known to be weak. 
pliant time servers. They are not to aim at self-exaltation or to shun disagreeable duties, but to perform God's work with unswerving fidelity. Though God had granted the prayer of Moses in sparing Israel from destruction, their apostasy was to be uh, to be signally uh, punished. The lawlessness and insubordination into which Aaron had permitted them to fall, if not speedily crushed, will run riot in wickedness and will involve the nation in irretrievable ruin. By terrible severity, the evil must be put away. Standing in the gate of the camp, Moses called the people who is on the Lord's side, let him come unto me. Those who had not joined in the apostasy were to take their position at the right of Moses. Those who are guilty but repentant at the left. The command was obeyed. It was found that the tribe of Levi had taken no part in the adulterous worship. From among other tribes, there were great numbers who, uh, although they had sinned, now signified their repentance. But a large company, mostly of uh, the mixed multitude that instigated the making of the calf, stubbornly persisted in their rebellion. In the name of the Lord, God of Israel, Moses now commanded those upon his right hand who had kept themselves clear of idolatry to guard on their swords and slay all who persisted in rebellion. And there fell off the people that day among 3,000 men. Without regard to position, kindred, or friendship, the ringleaders in wickedness were cut off, but all who repented and humbled themselves were spared. It, it, it won't make sense to say Moses in the name of the Lord did something and then turn 360 degrees and say actually it was not at the command of the Lord that we have to understand the text in a spiritual or symbolic way because the Bible is deficient of language and the Bible is not the mode, uh, God's mode of speech. It, it won't really make sense to uh, uh, say such a, a thing. And so the people who would want us to understand things in another way will say that uh, actually we need to understand the language of the Bible more than that which is revealed uh, 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 at this uh, place. But uh, E.G. White now uh, sheds, uh, sheds the light uh, on this issue of uh, uh, adultery and how God was able to deal with it. Again, those who performed this terrible work of judgment were acting by divine authority, executing the sentence of the king of heaven. This is PP 324.2. Men are to be aware how they, in their human blindness, judge and condemn their fellow men. But when God commands them to execute his sentence upon iniquity, he is to be obeyed. Those who performed this painful act thus manifested their abhorrence of rebellion and adultery and consecrated themselves more fully to the service of the true God. The Lord honored their faithfulness by bestowing special distinction upon the tribe of Levi. How we can really read this and say God does not destroy is something that uh, I really don't understand and something that really you can't convince my mind that with this clear statement, that you can turn and say it's not God who made or who commanded such an act. We are looking at God shall execute judgment and things are not left in the hands of Satan to roll as uh, people think that they should roll. The Israelites had been guilty of treason and that uh, against a king who had loaded them with benefits and whose authority they had voluntarily pledged themselves to obey that the divine government might be maintained justice must be visited upon the traitors yet even here god's mercy was displayed while he maintained his law he granted freedom of choice and opportunity for repentance to all only those who were cut off who only those who were cut off who persisted in rebellion again it was necessary that this sin should be punished as a testimony to surrounding nations of God's dis displeasure against idolatry. By executing justice upon the guilty, Moses, as God's instrument, must live on record a solemn and a public protest against their crime. 
as the Israelites should hereafter condemn the adultery of the neighboring tribes, their enemies would throw back upon them the charge that the people who claimed Jehovah as their God had made a cult and worshipped it in Horeb. Then, though compelled to acknowledge the disgraceful truth, Israel could point to the terrible fate of the transgressors as evident that their sin had not been sanctioned and excused. Now, continued on in 325.2, E.G. White says, Love, no less than justice, demanded that for this sin judgment should be inflicted. God is the guardian as well as the sovereign of his people. He cuts off those who are determined upon rebellion that they may not lead others to ruin. In sparing the life of Cain, God had demonstrated to the universe what would be the result of permitting sin to go unpunished. The influence exerted upon his descendants by his life and teaching to the state of corruption that demanded the destruction of the whole world by a flood. The history of the antediluvian testifies that long life is not a blessing to the sinner. God's great forbearance did not repress their wickedness. The longer men live, the more corrupt they become. So with the apostasy at Sinai, unless punishment had been speedily visited upon the transgression, the same results will again have been seen. The earth will have become as corrupt as in the days of Noah. Had these transgressors been spared, evils would have followed greater than resulted from sparing the life of Cain. It was the mercy of God that thousands should suffer to prevent the necessity of visiting judgments upon millions. In order to save the many, he must punish the few. Furthermore, as the people had cast off their allegiance to God, they had forfeited the divine protection and deprived of their defense, the whole nation who was exposed to the power of their enemies. Had not the evil been promptly put away, they would soon have fallen a prey to their numerous and powerful foes. It was necessary for the good of Israel and also as a lesson to all succeeding generations that crime should be promptly punished. And it was no less a mercy to the sinners themselves that they should be cut short in their evil course. Had their life been spared, the same spirit that led them to rebel against God would have been manifested in hatred and strife among themselves and they would eventually have destroyed one another. It was in love to the world, in love to Israel, and even to the transgressors that crime was punished with swift and terrible severity. And so this is the story of uh, the golden calf and how God speedily visited the situation. Uh, as the people were aroused to see the enormity of their guilt, terror pervaded the entire encampment. It was feared that every offender was to be cut off. Pitying their distress, Moses promised to plead once more with God for them. And uh, uh, when uh, Moses went to the Lord, uh, uh, he, he told the Lord that uh, 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 when, when Moses uh, went to the people, he told the people that ye have sinned a great sin, and now I'll go up to the Lord. For adventure, I shall make an atonement for your sin. And then Moses went in his a confession before God and said, Oh, these people have sinned a great sin and have made them God of gods of God. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not blot me, I pray thee out of thy book which thou hast written. The answer from the Lord was that uh, whomsoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my name. Now, the the behavior and the attitude of Moses approaching the Lord that blot my name out of the book if you will not forgive these people is uh, an attitude that will not find even among the most reformed people in such a time. That is why Moses actually uh, was said to be the meekest person that ever lived. And we don't know if there shall be any other person like Moses. For him to say, blot out my name. The, the only other instance we find somebody saying that is Paul. I think it is in Romans chapter 9 when he says that, I wish I were cut off from the stock of Israel if they who had the oracles of God could be drafted in once again. These are the two people that we read in the Bible 
they were ready to forfeit their place in the kingdom so that sinners may have a chance of um, once again uh, being uh, drafted back in the kingdom of God. And uh, in the prayer of Moses, our minds are directed to the heavenly records in which the names of all men are inscribed. Blot my name out of the book. And the deeds of men, whether good or evil, are faithfully registered there. And you can read that in Malachi 2, that there is a book of remembrance. And so also there, we have the book of life. As we see Moses pleading, also the same thing, we find that uh, um, there is a book of life that Paul mentioned, uh, mentioned in, I think, in the book of Philippians. Uh, I can't recall very well, but also there is uh, a book of life in the book of Revelation chapter 13 and uh, Revelation chapter 20. So the book of life or the books in heaven, it's not an Adventist idea. It is not as a, a face-saving doctrine. We have the books open in Daniel chapter 7 also. And so if any of these depart from him and by stubborn persistence in sin become finally hardened against the influence of his Holy Spirit, their names will be blotted out from the book of life and they themselves will be devoted to destruction. Now, there is a lot of talk about um, God does not visit judgment, but only what he does is a divine recession. At the end of the day, the people don't die of their own. There is an involvement of God in executive uh, judgment. And uh, we shall be seeing uh, uh, in a short while uh, that. But um, when you go to the book of um, the book of Matthew, just want to take us in the book of Matthew, God will execute judgment. In the book of Matthew, chapter 25, Uh, chapter 25, verse uh, 41, Matthew chapter 25, verses 41. We are told, Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, cast into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. This does not sound like a divine recession. A fire has been prepared for the devil and his angels. God never made fire for any human being. But when the angels left their first estate and they rebelled against the God of heaven and they were thrown down, we are told fire has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, it is not the devil who has prepared the fire. We are not told that the devil is left to the divine recession. But God has prepared fire. Now, in the book of uh, Ezekiel also, look at the book of Ezekiel, chapter 28. Ezekiel 28. Um, and uh, verse 18. Look at this verse 18. Let me just for... A session highlighted. It says, Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore, I'll bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I'll bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all men that behold thee. Think about that that God is the one who shall bring the fire itself. When you go to Revelation, I didn't even need to go there, that the fire that comes to clean the earth also destroys the sin completely. Again, uh, when you go to the sanctuary message, you find that uh, there was no one who lighted the fire on the altar to burn the sin offerings. It was the fire from the Lord that consumed the sin offering. And Asaf, talking about this, we can go to Psalms. We can go to the book of Psalms and just um, look at this. Psalm 73. 
a psalm of Asa. Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. And uh, Asaph continues to say, But as for me, my feet was almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped, for I was envious of, at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they pl plagued like other men. Therefore pride compasses them about as a chain, violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness, they have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak closely. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people return hither and waters of a full cup are wrung uh, out to them. And they say, how doth God know? And is there knowledge in the most high? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say I'll speak thus, behold, I shall offend against the generation of the children. When and when I hold, hold on, when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. Now, Asaph who has been envying sinners, doesn't find the answer to the end of the sin outside the sanctuary, but inside the sanctuary. When he went into the sanctuary, the way, oh God, is in the sanctuary, he understood the end of the wicked. And how do you understand the end of the wicked? I think uh, Paul mentioned something, if I'm not wrong, in Hebrews chapter 6. In the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 6, he says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on, on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God. Of the doctrine of baptism and of the laying on of hands and of the resurrection of the dead and of the eternal judgment. And this will do, we will do if God permit. And so, it is only when you go to the sanctuary, when this is in the courtyard, actually, Paul is speaking about where all these things were done and of the eternal judgment, how it will be executed. The sanctuary itself was uh, a plan of redemption, how man shall be saved and how sin shall be dealt with. And so to come up with a language that is out of the sanctuary, that things are just left on their own to develop, it is no term. Um, actually something that um, uh, really makes sense. It is not common sense to appeal uh, to this. Now, the case of Uzzah. L let us look at the case of Uzzah. The ark remained in the house of Abinadab until David was made king. He gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000, and went to bring up the ark of God. They set the ark upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab. Uzzah and Ahio, sons of Abinadab, drove the cart. David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of musical instruments. And when they came to Nachon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah. Now, this is not the anger of Satan, but the anger of the Lord. It is not even a divine recession, and God smote him there for his terror. And there he died by the ark of God. God smote Uzzah. Continued on. Uzzah was angry with the oxen because they stumbled. He showed a manifest distrust of God, as though he would, although, as though he who had brought the ark from the land of Philistine could not take care of it. Angels who attended the ark struck down Uzzah for presuming impatiently to push his hand upon the ark of God. In, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in PK, we have information that also Uzzah had unconfessed sins, and he wanted to look inside uh, the ark of the covenant, with something that was prohibited that no one shall look inside. The Kohites who used to carry this instrument, they were not look inside. The high priest or the prophet had to cover the ark 
and then the staffs were to be entered beside the ark itself and it could be borne on the shoulders without anyone looking inside. But we find here Uzzah, uh, in PK you can find that he had unconfessing and he wanted to look inside and also the method they used to bring the ark was not the method which was prescribed in numbers. And so while God was still overlooking things, others were going overboard with his patience. And so uh, God's anger kindled against was a theory of eternal torment opposite extreme. Now, there's a case that is connected with the eternal judgment, uh, etern etern there's a case that is connected with executive, executive judgment, uh, and it is the eternal torment the uh, theory. And I, I just want us to go through this, and this is um, uh, Great Controversy 536 downwards from paragraph 3. The theory of eternal torment is one of the false doctrines that constitute the wine of abomination of a Babylon of which he makes all nations to drink, Revelation 14, 4, 8, and 17, 2. That ministers of Christ should have accepted this heresy and proclaim it from the sacred desk is indeed a mystery. Continued on, they received it from Rome and they received the false Sabbath. True, it has been taught by great and good men, but the light on this subject had not come to them as it has come to us. The eternal torment doctrine they were responsible only for the light which shone in their time we are accountable for that which shines in our in our day if we turn from the testimony of god's word and accept false doctrines because our fathers taught them we fall under the condemnation pronounced upon babylon we are drinking of the wine of her abomination a large class to whom the doctrine of eternal torment is revolting are driven to the opposite era now, the eternal torment doctrine is this, and uh, I heard it when I was still uh, a Sunday keeper. Before I came to Seventh-day Adventist and got the truth about it, this is the way we used to believe when I was a Sunday keeper, that um, the eternal torment is when uh, God shall come back again. The sinners, if you are a sinner and you never repented, one of your fingers will be burning for a thousand years and another one for a thousand years, then your toes, then your hand, then your leg. And um, it, think about it. If one of my finger is burning for a thousand years, another one a thousand years, then five fingers of my hand have to burn for 5,000 years. And then goes, God goes to the hand, which I don't know how, how long it will burn. And so we have 5,000 here, we have 5,000 here, that, those are 10,000 years, and we have the, the toes, uh, again, 5,000 years, 5,000 years, there we have 20,000 years just for the fingers of the hand and the toes of the leg. And I, I don't know where people got this theory, but we were taught like that when we were still mm -hmm. Sunday keepers. And so you will be burning like forever in quotes, forever. Let us just take the word forever, burning, eternal torment. That is just burning one part, one part, a little. And you are not dying. That is the doctrine of eternal torment. When I came to Adventism, that is when I got the truth. So the people who proclaim this truth, who, uh, uh, sorry, the people who proclaim this uh, issue of uh, theory of eternal torment, they revolt to another opposite when they come out of this and what which side from one extreme to the other extreme which extreme they see that the scriptures represent god as a being of love and compassion and they cannot believe that he will consign his creatures to the fires of an eternally burning hell and we understand eternally is the consequences and so once people come out that God will be punishing people for thousand, thousand years, now they fall on the other opposite extreme that uh, actually God will punish no one. And if God will not punish anyone, it means that people live forever. And because the doctrine of uh, uh, immortal spirit is connected to this, then it means that a sinner will never die but we live forever because when people die, they still live. And 
it throws away the scriptures in uh, Ezekiel chapter 18, which says that the soul that sinneth shall die. And so you can see this doctrine that um, God is not the one who excuses judgment. Actually, I don't want to misrepresent somebody, but it, it falls short of addressing simple questions uh, in the scriptures that God will work on the sin issue. Now, but holding that the soul is naturally immortal, they see no alternative but to conclude that all mankind will be finally saved. Many regard the threatenings of the Bible as designed merely to frighten men into obedience and not to be literally fulfilled. And so judgment shall be literally fulfilled, not symbolically or spiritually fulfilled. Judgment shall be literally fulfilled. Now, common sense really uh, implies that we take literally as literal. I cannot say I'll literally come and then I, I send somebody to come. Thus the sinner can live in selfish pleasure, disregarding the requirements of God and yet expect to be finally received into his favor. Such a doctrine presuming upon God's mercy, but in ignoring his justice, pleases the carnal heart and emboldens the wicked in their iniquity. Let us look at the punishment of Korah. Who did it? How carefully God protects the rights of men, he has attached a penalty to willful murder. Who so sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. Genesis 9.6 If one murderer were permitted to go unpunished, he would by his evil influence and cruel violence subvert others. This would result in a condition of things similar to that which existed before the flood. God must punish murderers. He gives life and he will take life if that life becomes a terror and a menace. Mercy shown to a willful murderer is cruelty to his fellow men. If a willful murderer thinks that he will find protection by fleeing to the altar of God, he may find that he will be forced from that altar and be slain. But if a man takes life unintentionally, then God declares that he will provide a place of refuge to which he can flee. Now, in the issue of the punishment of Korah, people went to sin against the Holy Ghost. And let us read on. Korah would not have taken the course he did had he known that all the directions and reproofs communicated to Israel were from God. But he might have known this. God had given overwhelming evidence that he was leading Israel. But Korah and his companions rejected light until they became so blinded that the most striking manifestations of his power were not sufficient to convince them. They attributed them all to human or satanic agency. All that the things that God did in the wilderness, Korah attributed all to human or satanic agency. The same thing was done by the people who the day after the destruction of Korah and his company came to Moses and Aaron saying, you have killed the people of the Lord. So now this is attributing things that are happening to the wilderness, in the wilderness to human by saying that Moses has killed the people of God. Notwithstanding they had had the most convincing evidence of God's displeasure at their cause in the destruction of the men who had deceived them, they dared to attribute his judgments to Satan and declaring that through the power of the evil one, Moses and Aaron had caused the death of go of good and holy men. It was this act that sealed their doom. They had committed the sin against the Holy Spirit, a sin by which man's heart is effectually hardened against the influence of divine grace. And so saying that people that are punished by God are punished by the devil, is committing the sin against the Holy Ghost and the heart is hardened and nothing can be done upon it but uh, uh, to be left unto destruction. Whoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, saith Christ, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him. Matthew 12, 32. These words were spoken by our Savior. When the gracious works which he had performed through the power of God were attributed by the Jewish to Beelzebub. It is through the agents of the Holy Spirit that God communicates with man and those who deliberately reject the agency as satanic 
have cut off the channel of communication before the soul and heaven. And so the brethren can sound so good. They can seem so pious, but I'm not saying they are lost, but uh, there is a deception that is happening. There is a blindness that is happening in the eyes of the people when they don't see that the executive judgment shall be literally fulfilled by God as we have um, read in uh, uh, patriarchs and uh, prophets. Now, a single angel destroyed all the firstborn of Egyptians and filled the land with mourning. When David offended against God by numbering the people, one angel caused that terrible destruction by which his sin was punished. But who is this angel that uh, really came to punish? The same destructive power exercised by what? Holy angels. Holy angels exercise destructive powers. So the same destructive power exercised by holy angels when God commands will be exercised by evil angels when he permits. There are forces now ready and only waiting the divine permission to spread desolation everywhere. So the issue is not a one-sided issue. It is a twofold thing. God can send holy angels to distract something. And then they can, God himself can permit evil angels to do their own bidding when he removes his divine protection. And so it's not a one coin thing. It is not a one-sided coin. It is a two-sided coin. And somebody may jump at that and say, this is a yin-yang where actually there is evil and good on the same. And this is what we call the Indian mysticism. But no. The, 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 the writings of E.G. White are so clear that good angels can be able to do destruction and evil angels, when God withdraws his protection, can do whatever uh, they want to do. Not that God has sent them to do, but they do what they want to do. The days of Noah, manuscript uh, number 963. As there is only Noah's day, they reason today. Now, it is good that Noah is mentioned because we are told, as it were in the days of Noah, so shall be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. So, as they reason in the days of Noah, so they reason today. What is this thing that they reason in the day of Noah that they are reasoning today also? When the warning message is proclaimed to fear God and keep his commandments, the wrath of God is soon to fall all the on all the sinful and disobedient, and they will perish in the general conflagration. Professed servants of Christ who are unfaithful, who do not reverend God, and with fear prepare for the terrible future event, will lull themselves to carnal security with their fallacious reasoning, as they did in Noah's day. So these reasonings are fallacious. God is too good and too merciful, they reason, to save just a few who keep the Sabbath and believe the message of warning. The great men and the good men, the philosophers and men of wisdom will see the Sabbath and the shortness of time if it were true. They do not believe a merciful God who made men will consume them with fire because they do not believe the warnings given. This, the reason, is not in accordance with God. And there is the statements we hear everyone that this is unlike God. This is unlike Christ. The same philosophy that existed in the days of Noah, so it exists also today. God's love is represented in our day as being of a, such a character as will forbid his destroying the sin. Men reason from their own low standard of right and justice. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such an one as thyself, Psalm 50:21. They measure God by themselves. They reason as to how they will act under the circumstances and decide God will do as they imagine they will do. 12 Mar 207.2 In 28.1, God's goodness and long forbearance, his patience and mercy exercise to his subject will not hinder him from punishing, punishing the sinner who refused to be obedient to his requirements. 
it is not for a man, a criminal, against God's whole law, pardoned only through the great sacrifice he made in giving his son to die for the guilty because his law was changeless to dictate God. And may I say what God will do. After all this effort on the part of God to preserve the sacred and exalted character of his law, if men through the sophistry of the devil turn the mercy and condemnation of God into a curse, they must suffer the penalty. Because Christ died, they consider they have liberty to transgress God's holy law that condemns the transgressor and will complain of its strictness and its penalty as severe and unlike God. They are uttering the words Satan utters to millions to quiet their conscience in rebellion against God. Now, God's kingdom is not left to Satan to execute judgment. 12 Matthew or 8.2. Here we read. God's king, in, in, in no kingdom or government is it left to the lawbreakers to say what punishment is to be executed against those who have broken the law. Now, that, that is very important. All we have, all the boundaries of grace, of his grace which we possess we owe to god the aggravating character of sin against such a god cannot be estimated any more than the heavens can be measured with a span god is a moral governor as well as a father he is the lawgiver he makes and executes his laws he doesn't leave his laws to another to execute law that has no penalty is of no force in 12 mr 8.3 we are told the plea may be made that a loving father will not see his children suffering the punishment of God by fire while he had the power to relieve them. But God would, for the good of his subjects and for their safety, punish the transgressor. God does not work on the plan of man. He can do infinite justice that man has no right to do before his fellow man. man. Noah would have displeased God to have drowned one of the scoffers and mockers that harassed him but god drowned the vast world lord would have had no right to inflict punishment on his sons in law but god will do it in strict justice now this point is what i want to look at noah would have displeased god to have drowned one of the scoffers and mockers that harassed him and lord will have had no right to inflict punishment on his sons in law now just to think about that thought we are not even as Christian to tell God how he should deal with the sin. This is something so important because sometimes we are wrong and uh, we are like this. God, uh, this person has done this to me and I feel it is so grievous. If he can repent and be saved, Lord, let him die. Such a prayer as I have made. And I know many people have made such a prayer as we have heard them. But now I ask the Lord to forgive me. For it is not left upon us to decide for God what he will do with the sinner. He himself knows what to do with the sinner. He is the moral governor. He is um, uh, the law giver. And no one is to tell the Lord that now this father, this person has gone. Only what I wish for him is to die because... I don't see salvation in him. We have uttered this statement. I have uttered them. Many people whom I'm close to have uttered this statement. But how I pray that God may forgive me right now and forgive us for uttering such a statement. We make them in haste without thinking. If God uh, will punish that person, where would they get? Uh, if God will uh, really respond, for God will punish the people. But if he will respond to our plea, do you think anyone will be living today, even I who is speaking right now? Because there are things which I have done in my life, both when I was still in the world and after I became a Christian, that if you will hear about them, you will say this man is not worthy to live. But then God is here. He never listened to anyone who prayed like that. And we think we can pray like that and God answer it. That God, this person has done me so wrong. If he can be saved, just uh, finish him. May the Lord forgive us. And may the Lord start with me. And so, Noah would have 
displeased God to have drowned one of the scoffers and mockers that harassed him, but God drowned the vast world. Lot would have had no right to inflict punishment on his sons in law, but God will do it in strict justice. A case of uh, a Sabbath breaker, when even Moses didn't know what to do. In Numbers chapter 15, 22 to 36. On one occasion, the son of an Israelitish woman and of an Egyptian, one of the mixed multitude that had come up with Israel from Egypt, left his own part of the camp and entered that of the Israel, claimed the right to pitch his tent there. This the divine law forbade him to do. The descendants of an Egyptian being excluded from the congregation until the third generation. A dispute arose between him and an Israelite, and the matter being referred to the judges was decided against the offender. PP 407.4 Enraged at this decision, he cursed the judge and in the heat of passion blasphemed the name of God. He was immediately brought before Moses. The command had been given, he that curseth his father or his mother shall surely be put to death, Exodus 21, 17. But no provision had been made to meet this case, meaning men could not execute the judgment unless by divine revelation. Think about that. This is one of the cases that Moses had not a law for it. And he could not say that I'll take the provision of cursing the father and because this one has cursed the judge and because if you curse the father, you should be killed. Then because this one cursed the judge and the judge is like the father, then I'll take this provision and um, do an executive judgment based upon it. This is how even the constitutions work in many countries, that they take a provision of another law and apply it in another case. Moses could not do that. This is not how the government of God works, taking provisions and applying in cases which are not divinely uh, revealed. And so let us see what happened. So terrible was the crime that uh, there was felt to be a necessity for special direction from God. Now they are not gazing about this and they are not leaving the things to the devil to do them. The man was placed in a ward until the will of the Lord could be ascertained. God himself pronounced the sentence. By the divine direction, the blasphemer was conducted outside the camp and stoned to death. Those who had been witness to the sin placed their hands upon his head, thus solemnly testifying to the truth of the charge against him. Then they threw the first stones. The people who stood by afterward joined in executing the sentence. And that is PP for 7.5. The punishment of uh, Jericho. The city of Jericho was uh, devoted to the most extravagant idolatry. The inhabitants were very wealthy, but all the riches that God had given them, they counted as the gift of their gods. They had gold and silver in abundance, but like the people before the flood, they were corrupt and blasphemous and insulted and provoked the God of heaven by their wicked works. God's judgments were awakened against Jericho. It was a stronghold. But the captain of the Lord's host himself came from heaven to lead the armies of heaven in an attack upon the city. Angels of God laid hold of the massive walls and brought them to the ground. Brothers and sisters, this is not something to argue upon. And uh, somebody will bring out the statement that um, Jesus was the example of God. And whatever Jesus never did, then God cannot do. And what is this issue that Jesus was an example of God? He never punished anyone or he never spoke anything against one. And even when he was resurrecting the body of Moses, he never cast the devil. Now, hold on, we shall read there. But then, let us not forget this, that the angels of God came from heaven themselves and put the massive walls, uh, um, took hold of the massive walls and brought them down. God had said that the city of Jericho should be accursed and that all should perish except Rahab and her household. This should be saved because of the favor that Rahab showed the messengers of the Lord. 
the word of the Lord to the people was, and ye in any wise keep yourself from the accusing, lest ye make yourself accursed when you take of the accusing, and make the camp of Israel accursed and trouble it. And Joshua adjured them at that time, saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord that rises up and buildeth this city, Jericho. He shall lay the foundation thereof in the firstborn, and in his youngest son shall he set up the gates of it. In First Kings chapter 16, verse 34, we read, In his days did Hiel the Bethelite build Jericho. He laid the foundation thereof in Abraham, his first son, firstborn, and set up the gate thereof in his youngest son, Zegu, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Joshua the son of Nun, that they died because that was an accursed thing. And it is a punishment that God visited upon these people. Looking at the last conflict in the great controversy, another deception was now to be brought forward. Satan declared that mercy destroyed justice, that the death of Christ abrogated the Father's law. And uh, this is the issue. What does the commandment say? Thou shalt not murder. And so, by Christ dying on the cross, we are told that God abrogated his law. If God is the one who allowed Jesus Christ to die, then his law was abrogated. Let me just read the statement again. Another deception now to be brought forward. Satan declared that mercy destroyed justice, that the death of Christ abrogated the Father's law. And so what is Satan doing here? He is taking thou shalt not murder to prove that God does not kill or God does not destroy. Let me use that because people have negative issues on God when you talk about kill. And so uh, if we say that God destroys sinners, then it is like saying God murders and that abrogates the commandment, the law of God. But then, I won't go into the Greek and Hebrew of this thing. Let us just read what the messenger says. Had it been possible for the law to be changed or abrogated, then Christ need not to have died. But, the, but to abrogate the law would be to immortalize transgression and place the world under certain control. It was because the law was changeless, because man could be saved only through obedience to it is precept that Jesus was lifted up on the cross. Yet, the very means by which Christ established the law, Satan represented as destroying it. Here will come the last conflict of the great controversy between Christ and Satan. What is the last conflict? God will have to save everyone and punish Noah. And then it will be used as a means that if you say that God punishes these sinners, you abrogate his law. You, you, you go against his own law, I mean. And so you hear this message of grace, grace, just believe, just believe, and nothing else. God did away with his law and sinners will live forever. Because what? God does not destroy. But if God destroys, then he is against on his own commandments. So the philosophers say. The seven last plague and the judgment, who will make them? Early writing 52.1. At the general conference of believers in the present truth held at Sutton. This is a conference of believers in the present truth, not in error or uh, checking this or trying this. This meeting was held at Sutton, Vermont, September 1850. I was shown that the seven last plagues will be poured out after Jesus leaves the sanctuary. Say the angel, it is the wrath of God and the Lamb that causes the destruction or death of the wicked. At the voice of God, the saints will be mighty and terrible as an army with banners, but they will not then execute the judgment written. The executive execution of the judgment will be at the close of 1,000 years. After the saints are changed to immortality and caught up together with Jesus, after they receive their harps, their robes, and their crowns and enter the city, Jesus and the saints sit in judgment. The books are open, the book of life and the book of death. The book of life contains the good deeds of the saints and the book of death contains the evil deeds of the wicked. These books are compared with the statute book, the Bible. 
and according to that men are judged the saints in unison with jesus pass their judgment upon the wicked the whole said the angel the saints in unison with jesus sit in judgment and met out the wicked according to the deeds done in the body and that which they must receive at the execution of the judgment is set off against their names this i saw was the work of the saints with jesus through the 1000 years in the holy city before it descends to the earth then at the close of the 1000 years jesus with the angels and all the saints leaves the holy city and while he is descending to the earth with them the wicked dead are raised and then the very men that pierced him being raised will see him afar in all his glory the angels and saints with him and and will wail because of him they will see the prince of the nails in his hands and his feet and where they thrust the spear into his side the prince of the nails and the spear will then be his glory it is at the close of the 1000 years that jesus stands at the mount of olives and the mount parts asunder and becomes a mighty plain those who flee at that time are the wicked who have just been raised then the holy city comes down and settles on the plain satan then imbues the wicked with his spirit he flatters them that the army in the city is small and that his army is large and that they can overcome the saints and take the city while satan was rallying his army the saints were in the city beholding the beauty and glory of the paradise of god jesus was at their head leading them all at once the lovely savior was gone from our company but soon we heard his lovely voice saying come ye blessed of my father inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world we gathered about jesus uh, jesus and just as he closed the gates the city uh, gates of the city the curse was pronounced upon the wicked the gates were shut then the saints used their wings and mount, mounted to the top of the wall of the city jesus was also with them his crown looked brilliant and glorious it was a crown within a crown seven in number and the hold on we are told it was a crown within a crown and seven in number and so here we want to see at last what happens when they want to attack the city in uh, in early writing page 54 paragraph 1 this is what we find after that uh incident where christ appears at the top of uh, the city what happens next early writing 54.1 then the wicked saw what they had lost and fire was breathed from god upon them and consumed them this was the execution of the judgment the wicked then received according as the saints in unison with jesus had meted out to them during the 1000 years the same fire from god that consumed the wicked purifies the whole earth now this is um, we are looking at an appeal to common sense and not only common sense but after having the evidence i want you to think about this for a moment we are told the punishment of the wicked and satan is divine recession and sinners are left on their own but look at the statement where well. the fire that destroyed the sinners cleanses the earth now if you are saying that it is by divine recession that the wicked are punished then it is by divine recession that the earth is cleansed do you see that logic is that common sense the fire that destroys the wicked is the one that cleanses the earth but if the sinners are destroyed by divine recession or by the will of satan then it means that the earth that the saints shall live in after sin was cleansed by satan or it was purified and you know she uses the word purified is it purified or what it let us just read the same fire from god that consumed the wicked purified the whole earth and so either it is by divine recession that 
the earth is purified. But again, if to just beat the logic that um, it is by divine recession that sinners are punished. If Christ withdraws himself, sinners are punished. Let us accept that for a second. And nothing good is coming out of it. Christ, by divine recession, cannot purify the earth. He spoke and it happened, and whatever he will, happened. And so it cannot be by divine recession that the earth is purified, or it cannot be the act of the devil that sinners just um, are destroyed by themselves. By, the the, 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 by, by destroying themselves, they purify the earth. That, that is how I'm reasoning. I don't want to make it seem so worse with the people who say that God does not uh, destroy anyone. But I'm um, logical reasoning. I'm um, appealing to common sense. The fire that comes from God purifies the earth. And so sinners are not left on their own. Because if they are left on their own to perish, then they are, by their perishing, so is the purification of the earth. And God does not resist himself to make something good or to purify something. God takes something in his hand to purify it or by his divine will or by his word and all that. Uh, I hope that you catch what I'm saying. So that fire comes from him and uh, uh, actually the earth is cleansed. As we just uh, bring this to an end, we are told um. There is always this argument that Christ came to veil God and what Christ did not do, his father cannot do. That, that is how people reason. I'm not saying everyone, but some people. This is a special pleading that has no sense. Jesus did many things that his father will not do and did not do many things that his father will do. Jesus could die, his father could not. Jesus could not reveal the day and hour of his second coming, the father will do. Jesus was baptized, his father cannot. Jesus' first coming was not to establish the kingdom of glory, which has to be preceded with the execution of judgment. For executive judgment to happen, there must be an investigation, judgment, and this is what Christ came to do, investigate the sons of men. He came to establish the kingdom of grace. He did not come here to do some uh, executive judgment and establish the kingdom of glory. He came as a servant and not as a ruler, not as a king, so to confuse the works and the two kingdoms is to confound the purpose of his first and his second coming. To put these things together like this is to confound his um, uh, coming on the earth. And so when Jesus was here, he was a lamb to be slain. He was coming not here as a, a, a person to execute judgment before even investigative judgment could be done. And so it is said, the Lord Jesus came to a world not to reveal what a God could do, but what a man could do. Through faith in God's power to help in every emergence, man is through faith to be partaker in the divine nature and to overcome every temptation where he is. He did not come here to demonstrate what God can do, but what man could do. Uh, uh, and uh, just so that you may know, I'm quoting from E.G. White this uh, statement that uh, in uh, 7 B.C. 929.6, the Lord Jesus came to our world not to reveal what God could do, but what man could do. And so when he was here, he was not here as a king. In fact, he, re he refused to accept kingship until the triumphal entry in Jerusalem. And the Israelites were mistaken that what Christ had come to do in uh, his first coming was to set up a kingdom and to punish the nations that were ruling over Israel. They were very disappointed. And so that misunderstanding is carried on with the people who again have to say that uh, Christ what Christ did not do, God cannot do. And because Christ never punished anyone, God cannot punish anyone. Uh, looking at this, how God blots the sinner out of the book of life and leaves to Satan to punish them 
how he sends his angels and men to destroy, then turns 360 degrees and say he does not destroy, is not an appeal to common sense, and it sounds illogical. And I'll read the last verse in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 19. This is the point we are closing. Deuteronomy chapter 19. Deuteronomy chapter 19, and uh, I'm looking at uh, verse uh, 15 downwards. This is the portion I'm going to read, and we pray. One witness shall not rise against a man for any iniquity or for any sin in any sin that he sinneth. At the mouth of two witness or at the mouth of three witness shall the matter be established. If a false witness shall, if a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong, then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, before the priest and the judges which shall be in those days. And the judges shall make diligent inquisition and behold, if the witness be a false witness and hath testified falsely against his brother, then shall ye do unto him as he had thought to have done unto his brother, so shall thou put the evil away from among you. And those which shall remain and those which remain shall hear and fear and shall henceforth commit no more any such a evil among you. And thine eye shall not pity, but life shall go for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Now people will say, uh, these were laws to Israel as men and not as the mode of offerings with God or with the divine uh, 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 father. But then he says, look at this, that um, then shall ye do unto him as he had thought to have done unto his brother, so shall thou put the evil away from among you. Now, in Nahum 1.9, we read, what you imagine against the Lord, he will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. So, whatever the devil thought to do to the Son of God, whatever he thought to him, it shall be brought to an end. And who shall bring it to an end? It is not human beings who shall bring to an end these things. It is God himself who shall bring to an end these things. And you can read that in Revelation chapter 14 where it says that the earth is ripe to be harvested. Let me just show you this in uh, Revelation chapter 14. Now, there are two harvests in Revelation. I'll just go to the next harvest, which says, And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. This is the seven last plagues, because in Revelation chapter 15, verse 8, probation closes, and in, in uh, Revelation chapter 16, what fo follows are the seven last plagues. And so, and the winepress was trodden. The, the clusters which were thrown in the great wine place of the wrath of God, they were trodden without the city. And the blood came out of the wine place even unto the horse bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred far longs. Who is treading the wine press? This who, who is treading this wine press, if we may ask ourselves? Revelation 19. Who is trading the wine press? Let us read Revelation chapter 19. And it says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. This is the name of Jesus. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself 
and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. This is Jesus himself, John 1.1. 1, 1. And the armies which were in heaven followed him after upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nation, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of the Almighty God. Jesus Christ himself is the one trading the winepress that we have read in uh, the book of uh, John chapter, uh, uh, Revelation chapter 14, that he traded the winepress. And so I just want to say, may the Lord bless us. What did we, how did we bring, start this um, presentation? I'll just remind you how this actually how we started the presentation very simple from great controversy page 556 i want us to read this this is how we started the theory which forms the very foundation of spiritualism is at war with the plainest statements of the scripture it is spiritualism to be at war with the plainest statements of the scriptures and so may god help us that we may not just understand spiritualism is the immortality of the soul but also spiritualism is being at war with the plainest statements of the word of god and may god have mass upon us as uh, we live in these days that we may not be deceived by anything that sounds so good but at the end it shall be like a galling poison in our mouths. Our mouth. Shall we pray? Thank you, our Heavenly Father. You are God who will, at the end of the day, visit your children with a blessing. And for those who have refused their masses, they shall be left to reap what they sow. We cannot reap what we didn't sow. And because you are our moral governor, Lord, we look unto thee that uh, you may free us from the slaver of sin and the snares of Satan and give us a place in thy kingdom, not for our own good, but for what Christ has accomplished on Calvary for us. Help us not to reject this mercy and lull ourselves that thou shalt not do what you have promised you shall do. Bless your children this Sabbath. It is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>